Hi guys. So today I would like to talk about quadratic variation of a Brownian motion. So we've already talked about quadratic variation before and if you remember we talked about quadratic variation of a scaled symmetric random walk and I showed you that the quadratic variation at time t is nothing but equal to t, right? Or scale symmetric random walk accumulated quadratic variation at one per unit time, right? So today what we would like to do is we would like to talk about quadratic variation of a Brownian motion. But before we do that, we, you know, let's talk about um, a, a differentiable function, a continuously differentiable function and try to figure out what is the first order variation of that function and the quadratic variation of that function first. Once we, once we talk about that, we'll actually move on to Brownian motion and we'll study the quadratic variation and the first order variation of that, okay? So now let's assume that we have a function f of t and let's try to draw a function. This is the time axis and let's say the function looks something like this, okay? And we want to figure out what are the, what are the first order variation of this function at time capital T. Let's also identify a few other points here. So at time t1, this function takes the highest value right here. At time t2, the function takes the lowest value, okay? And we want to figure out what are the first order variation. The first order variation is denoted by first order variation of this function f at time t. This is how we denote it. And what we're trying to measure here is, we, first order variation basically measures the total up and down movement the function experiences till time t, where the downward movement basically adds to the upward movement, okay? So we basically are interested in the magnitude of the up and down movement. So for this function uh, right here, let's try to actually compute that. So between zero and t1, from here we can see that the function basically goes up, okay? What are the total up movement that the function experiences between zero and t1? That's very simple. It can be written as f of t1 minus f of t0, right? It basically only goes up between 0 and t1. And this is how much it goes up by. Between t1 and t2, the function goes down and it goes down by f of t2 minus f of t1, right? This is the total downward movement the function experiences between time t1 and t2. Now this quantity f of t2 minus f of t1 is negative because f of t2 is lower than f of t1. Hence this would be a negative quantity. So because we want to add the, the downward movement to the upward movement, and since this is a negative quantity, we need to subtract it. Okay, because minus minus becomes plus. Okay, so in effect, we're basically adding the magnitude to the upward move, right? And finally, between time t2 and t, the function again goes up and goes up by f of t minus f of t2. And this is a positive quantity. We need to add this, right? This basically gives us the total up and down movement the function experiences till time t. And in terms of integral, we can write it as integral t0 is 0, so 0, t1. And this can be written as f dash of t dt, right? f dash of t, integral of f dash of t would give us function back, f t, and f t evaluated between zero and t basically would give us this. So this is the first term. Now the second term, instead of negative, I'm writing positive here, plus here, and this is not, nothing but integral from t1 to t2. Now minus sign I'm gonna take inside and it will become f dash of t dt. This is the second term. And finally, the third term, integral t2 to t, f dash of t dt, right? And now I can combine this into a single integral and this would basically become integral from zero to t mod of f dash of t dt, right? Because this was a positive quantity, the negative quantity we basically made it into a positive quantity because we were interested in the magnitude of the downward move. And this was again positive, so this can be written as mod of this, right? This basically is what the first order variation for this function looks like. Now we can actually try to generalize this for any function f of t. Let's assume we have another